reality, captured in user-friendly symbols and processed for understanding. The Idea Channel. I'm Paul Spies, host of Guppies to Groupers. I've just finished watching the Life on Earth series. Pure excitement. Now, from my standpoint, I'm much more interested in the fish, tropical fish as applies to the hobby. But this series is beautiful. I've had an advantage on you in that I've seen it already, but you're going to be able to see it in January on PBS when it airs nationally. My excitement, I guess, is evident. Take a look at this and you'll be able to see why. There are some four million different kinds of animals and plants in the world. Four million different solutions to the problems of staying alive. This is the story of how some came to be as they are and of the millions of other creatures that have lived and become extinct since life began on Earth over three and a half billion years ago. Our guide is explorer and filmmaker David Attenborough. It's very, very rare that there is any violence within them. So it seems really very unfair that man should have chosen the gorilla to symbolize all that is aggressive and violent, when that's the one thing that the gorilla is not and that we are. Now you may have noticed that although I said I have a preference for fish, that there weren't any fish in what we just watched. Fish lovers relax, we have an episode all our own. Fish occur in populations of billions. There are over 30,000 species, more than in any other group of animals. They can fly, produce electricity, live in the black ocean depths, survive in hot soda springs, or even under the Antarctic ice. Now you've seen a little bit of the Life on Earth series, so you have some feel for why I'm so excited. But the real reason I'm here is to introduce you to David Attenborough. David is an author, producer, and narrator of the Life on Earth series. He's a naturalist, a zoologist, indeed a fellow of the Royal Zoological Society. We asked David to come here to Barron College in Erie, Pennsylvania, to meet with a group of people that have watched some of the Life on Earth series. And what we're going to see now are some vignettes taken from some of those meetings. What sort of questions have you got? Have you got a question? Yes. yes. Um, what's the most dangerous animal? The most dangerous animal of any kind? Us. We are the most dangerous animal. We kill things much more than any wild animals do. So I think it's us, really. Yeah. Um, is there any way you can tell if a fish is a male or female? Oh, yes. Um, um, there are, but there's no way in which I can say all fish have that and therefore they're male and all fish have that and therefore they're female. Uh, it depends on the kind of fish. You can tell um, some fish may be colored in a different way, some fish may have different shaped fins, and some fish may behave in different ways. Um, and some fish may not want to, as it were, let other fish know whether they're male or female, except in the breeding season. Because, you see, one of the problems that all animals have is keeping out of the way of danger. Because you don't want to be too bright, you don't want to advertise your, your position too much, because there may be a bigger fish that's waiting to eat you. So, you don't want to go around looking very bright and very colored and very obvious. You want to remain hidden. But you can't remain hidden forever because at some time you want to see, you want breeding time comes up and you need to see your mate. So the ways in which fish do that is, for, for a lot of them at any rate, is that they actually change for the breeding season. They actually get more brightly colored. The male gets more brightly colored usually. And he gets slightly longer friends often and more obvious and more showy. See? And he will, he will uh, keep that for just as long as it takes for him to, uh, 
to establish his territory, to attract this female to breed. And then when breeding is over, and he doesn't need to be obvious anymore, he loses his fins, or he loses the long fins, and he loses his color, and uh, he goes and uh, is not easy to see again. I'll tell you something really very, very extraordinary about male and female and how you tell male and female in fish. There are some fish that actually start off female and become male. Think about that. It's absolutely true, though. They change sex. Do you really think um, the dog is man's best friend? No, I don't think so. Um, I, I don't know, I suppose I think man's best friend is man, but um, uh, what would I say was man's best friend? I suppose if I had to, you see, that, uh, that question is really one, I mean, that saying is one which stems from man's far, far history. Because actually, the dog was the first animal that he domesticated. Back, I'm talking now, what am I, pair am I talking about? I'm talking about um, 200,000 years ago, when man was a hunter, and he didn't have any home, and he began to settle down. When he began to settle down into, a, into, into camps, is, it seems perfectly clear from the fossil evidence that dogs came around the camp as scavengers. And it also seems a fair bet that just as we were talking now about people being interested in animals, that women and girls took puppies from a very early stage and took them as pets and enjoyed having them as pets. And so puppies grew up and grew up in a circumstance in which it, they became part of the same pack as the human pack and assisted man in hunting. So that in a historical sense, what you say is that probably quite right. Man, dog, the dog was, if not man's best friend, probably his first friend in the animal world. When I was watching the movie, I saw that you were standing inside like a shark's jaw, yes. and I was wondering where you found it. Ah, well, I didn't find that. That's a very, very famous shark's jaw, and it's actually in New York. It's in the American Museum of Natural History, and uh, it's put together from teeth um, of a big shark, probably the biggest shark that ever existed. Um, and they're all put together on that jaw. But because I, as I explained to you, sharks don't have bones in their skeleton. They have cartilage, soft material. The jawbone has been made up out of plaster, and these teeth, which are the, the bits that survived in fossilized, have been stuck in it. But it, have a look at it. It's in the American Museum of Natural History. I noticed that you didn't use a lot of technical words when you were doing the film. You just used more common words. Is that just so that people can understand it better? Yes, I think that, that jargon, um, jargon has a use because, in fact, all jargon is is a kind of shorthand because if you want to be very precise about certain things so there's no misunderstanding, you may, using ordinary words, have to, sp have to speak a sentence. But if you're working with colleagues who were have the same problem all the time, you don't have to say that sentence every time. You just use that one word, which is in fact a technical term. And it should, if you really understand it, it should be possible in many instances to replace the four-syllable, five-syllable technical term with some straightforward, simple sentence. Uh, some of us, and I dare say I'm guilty as much as others, uh, take refuge in technical jargon every now and again. But we shouldn't, not when we're talking to a general audience in the process of filming and making, planning, and so on, of that series? Uh, the whole thing took us three years. Um, but in a way, uh, looking back on it now, uh, it seems to me that it took me sort of like a quarter of a century, really, <laughs> because uh, a, lot of the, um, a lot of the material which I needed to know about I've been gathering subconsciously for a quarter of a century because I, I've been extremely lucky in spending my time, a good deal of it at any rate, uh, filming, making natural history films in Borneo or in South America or whatever. Um, and when one comes to do this and you face this terrible problem, say, okay, what is important about the primates? What is, what is the crucial thing about primates? Um, and you only have to think about that. It's not very original thought. You only have to think about it for a bit, and you know, really, 
that the things that are important about primates are, are stereoscopic vision and a manipulative hand. And, and w once you have those two things, you have the seeds which are going to sprout into Homo sapiens. Um, and so once you've got that idea in your mind, if you've been around a bit, you think, yes, well, I know in Borneo just where I can get orangs. And I know in Africa just where I can see chimpanzees. And I know, too, that in central Congo, if you're lucky enough, you can actually get with gorillas. So you've got to, and, and I actually spent a long time, too, in Madagascar, because, and I knew a bit about the lemurs, so it all helped. Where did you go to school? Where did you well, I go to school? Oh, well, um, I'm English from, you know, unfortunately, there I am, I'm <laughs> stuck with it. Uh, and I went to school at a grammar school, a local, local school in, uh, in a place in the Midlands called Leicester. And then I went to Cambridge, and, uh, and then I managed to, to bamboozle the BBC into letting me make documentary films, and that's where I really started learning about animals. I mean, I, I was a zoologist, but uh, as we all know, you can learn a, learn a lot about zoology uh, sitting on a, on a lab bench like this, but somehow when you're out there in the middle of Africa, the animals are sort of rather different. And if you really want to know how to uh, film them, or how to understand them, or how to predict what they're going to do, or how know they're, they're going to bite you, or whether they're going to charge, you learn that out there, not in here. Yeah. Yes? Why are you interested in writing life on Earth? Why am I interested in writing it? Well, I suppose because I just love looking at animals. I love watching animals. I have been very lucky to sit in Central Africa and play with gorillas. Gorillas, a gorilla family actually came and sat down and, and, and sat on me and played. We played together. And I love watching birds of paradise displaying. And I love watching fish. So I like this, to write this book, I had to go right around the world several times and to go and see lots of lovely places and lots of lovely things. That's why I wrote it. I'm sure that you had a lot of problems <coughs> in filming a series like this. Did you have anything really unique or unusual, you know, any, anything attacked you? <laughs> um, the, the, most, uh, the most abiding memory, I've got to say, I mean, it's a rather obvious thing to say, really, but my most abiding memory of that three years, if you've seen the primate film, you've seen it, it was that extraordinary meeting with gorillas. Um, I should say straight away that it would be absolutely impossible to have met with gorillas in, in those sort of terms had it not been for the work of an um, absolutely miraculous American zoologist called Diane Fossey, who had been working with those gorillas for 10 years and had habituated them to, to human beings. So it was so possible, it was possible for us to get close to them. I mean, if it hadn't been for Diane, the chances of filming gorillas like that would have been nil, absolutely nil. But, uh, um, and if you were introduced by <coughs> Diane, then you could get close to them. But uh, I was absolutely unprepared for the overwhelming experience of being received into a guerrilla group, as we were. Uh, the, um, I mean, that in itself was, was, was moving enough. But the, what you feel when you sit with guerrillas is a, uh, an astounding affinity to these things. You have to behave with politeness in guerrilla society. I mean, it sounds sort of absurd. Guerrillas have manners. Guerrillas have manners. Mm. And if you, if you actually flout guerrilla manners, if you are ill-mannered in guerrilla terms, you're in for trouble. I mean, they won't, they won't stay, but they may be worse. I mean, they may, in fact, attack. Uh, to give you an example, you know, and I know, a whole human society knows, that if you wish to be deferential to someone, if you show respect to somebody, you actually you keep your voice, you don't shout at them, and you keep your voice fairly low, and you keep your hand fairly low. I mean, it's just formalized by the bow uh, or the nod. Um, okay. That is exactly the same in guerrilla society. And the converse is also the same in guerrilla society. If you wish to be aggressive, you actually stand up tall and, and dominate. Now, if you move into, into a gorilla's territory, that is a big silverback gorilla, male with maybe three females and four females and, and, and young, he's boss. I mean, it's, it's his territory. And if you go in and stand upright and talk loudly, he will either move away or attack. And if you, 
if on the other hand you wish to say, okay, it's your territory, and, and if, just as if you came into my territory, I would expect respect from you, so I'd give you my respect, then you keep down, you, you keep low. So that's why I was lying down. You keep your voice down, which is why I was sort of whispering. Um, and what's more, you keep your head down. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, that is simple good manners. And it was that kind of behavior, that, uh, I, I, I just felt in my bones, when I was those guerrillas, that I could convey what I was feeling in a profound sense to the guerrillas and they to me. And that I knew when I, uh, uh, when I was welcome, and I knew, just as they knew, when, okay, they'd had enough. I've been there for an hour. I've been sitting there playing with the babies, but nonetheless, I'm a stranger, potential danger. So we had to be a bit on edge. But okay, after an hour, we, we want to go back to feeding now. Do you mind? Certainly not. So you push on. <laughs> and, and that was one of the profound... I can't imagine what this question was. And they led, led, me off into, <laughs> led me off into all that. Uh, with your obvious respect for animals, what do you think about modern zoos, and how would you change them? I think zoos have two very important functions. I am quite sure that they will serve as refuges for species endangered. And I'm quite sure that you can't wait until a species is actually on the verge of extinction before you discover how to look after it. Uh -huh. And there is a technology of animal husbandry in zoos which we have to learn and can only learn through experience, and that experience resides in zoos. Um, zoos have already saved species, the Hawaiian goose, uh, the pear David's deer, many other smaller things, the corroboree frog, all kinds of creatures have been saved by zoos. That is a crucial function until mankind comes to its senses and can actually restore the environment to repopulate with those creatures. That's the first thing. The second thing is that mankind is becoming, urban man is becoming progressively cut off from the environment, progressively divorced from the animal world. And that is a disaster. It is a disaster, I mean, it's his loss, but it's also, if we are to manage the world in a sensible way, that is a crucial thing that you should have some empathy, some, some feeling the animal world. And I can put pictures of elephants on the screen till I'm blue in the face. I can produce nice books with colored illustrations of elephants till I'm blue in the face. But unless you've actually gone and stood by an elephant and seen the bulk of the thing and heard its belly rumbling and smelt it and see it shift about <coughs> creaking in its skin, you've not really understood what an elephant is. And that is another important element in zoos. So I am all for zoos, mm -hmm. from that point of view. But they only become tolerable if the animals are, are kept in conditions which is tolerable to them. <coughs> and a touchstone of that is whether they breed or not. If an animal breeds um, and doesn't molest its young and rears them, you can be reasonably sure, it seems to me, <coughs> in saying that, okay, it's relatively adapted to this environment, it's not too bad. Now, up to 20 years ago, zoos simply didn't bother about breeding, at least most didn't. I mean, they said, okay, it died, we're going to get another one. Today, thank goodness, uh, zoos are very much more uh, aware of this problem, and they don't plunder the resources of the wild in the way that they did. The 90% of the big mammals in the London Zoo breed. The best zoo in the world, in my book, is San Diego. I mean, sensational. Having said all that, I then have to say, to be absolutely truthful, that my own stomach for going to a zoo, I have lost. That if you're an extraordinarily privileged, as I have been, to sit with gorillas, it's very hard to go and watch gorillas in a zoo. You cannot but feel that those creatures are not living as full a life as they might otherwise do. So I find that difficult. Um, there are certain um, plants that you filmed, and you filmed the insides of them. How did your camera crew get the cameras inside the plants? Uh, well, I was going to say it's a professional secret. But of course, in fact, you can imagine that you actually have to bring it into a laboratory. If you want to, do, if you want to look inside plants, you may be thinking of the yucca plant, are you? Yeah. Is that the one that the fly fell into? That's right. <laughs> oh, and the bucket orchid, yes. Well, those um, 
In order to get inside a plant, you clearly don't have a, a camera which is the size of a marble. You actually have to cut the plant open. You sometimes have to adopt very subtle techniques to prevent it drying out and shriveling under hot lights. And to get the, get the insect to go on doing what it was doing before is also quite difficult. What are some of the most uh, difficult uh, tasks you had in photographing some of the animals? Well, um, the, we had 20 different camera crews working at various times. Um, and um, uh, my job was to, to write the script, which I did without any thought of mercy for these poor men. <laughs> and I would write in the most impossible thing. I mean, really absurd. There is, for example, um, a kind of frog called Darwin's frog, which lives in Tierra del Fuego on the farther and southern tip of South America. Um, and I, I read a research paper about the behavior of this frog. As you know, one of the problems that frogs have is how to provide liquid for their, for their young. Most of them just live in the water, and the tadpoles develop there. But other frogs have managed to populate land away from water, and Darwin's frog is one of them. And to exemplify the extraordinary techniques they use, I mentioned Darwin's frog because what it does is this. The female lays the eggs, and they're then fertilized, and the males, having fertilized them, then sit around looking at these little groups of eggs in a sort of gawpy way which frogs do. Um, and when, when there's movement inside the egg, the male frogs lean forward and apparently, to all intents and purposes, actually eat the eggs. And um, the eggs, in fact, don't go into the stomach. They go into the vocal sacs, which are the full, run the full length of the underside. And inside the vocal sacs, these ten a dozen eggs develop into tadpoles. So when you see a pregnant male Darwin's frog, as you might say, its underside is, is all wriggling with these, with these um, tadpoles all squirming about inside. An absolutely extraordinary sight. And it's obvious to anybody that, that, that the way, eventually, that the, those um, tadpoles are going to have to come out of the animal's mouth, out of the parent's and male's mouth. Uh, and as far as I know, nobody had ever seen this happen, ever. I mean, just assumed it happened. But so I, sitting in my study at home, just wrote it in, you know, a uh, frog opens mouth and tadpole uh, emerges. Uh, well, we went down to Tierra del Fuego, and we, we caught these pregnant male frogs. And of course, they weren't doing anything, nothing was happening. I took them back to Bristol, where we had a specialist cameraman called Roger Jackman. And I said to Roger, well now, You've got these pregnant male frogs, and Roger's very phlegmatic. Yes, yes. I said, well, we, what will happen is that he will open his mouth and this, the, the young will come out. Oh, yeah. And that's the shot we want. Oh, yeah. yeah. When's it going to happen? I said, well, I don't know. That's your problem. I'm, I'm going off to Madagascar. So Roger, Roger took these pregnant males, and he built a little set in his house, and he watched them, he and, him and his assistant, watched them continuously for 210 hours without taking their eyes off them. And then with that extraordinary sort of seventh sense, which really great naturalist photographers have, he knew that it was about to happen. Because it's no good, ha no good f pressing it after it's happened, or even while it's happening, you've got to press the button bef before it happens. And this little frog went so like that. Roger pressed the button, and then he, the frog did another couple of and then <coughs> he coughed, and this baby shot out of its mouth. And that was the first time First time it's ever been seen by human beings, as far as one can discover. Uh, and it's entirely Roger Jackman's credit. But that's the kind of photography that, that is in this series, and to which I, at any rate, I'm eternally grateful to the, all those cameramen who worked on it. How much thinking have you done about where life on Earth is headed? A bit. Particularly among the animals. Yes. Um, I. Um, the trouble is that the processes that have been initiated by man are so much swifter than the processes uh, of natural evolution that I think that the dominant factors that will influence the history of the, world, of the Earth over the next few thousand years are going to be non-evolutionary things which have been created by man. I mean, we are... Uh, it's, a, it's a cliche now, but in the last century, of course, we have totally, not totally, we have profoundly changed the nature of the surface of the Earth. We are in the process of changing in a major way the content of the atmosphere. Uh, we, 
unless we pull ourselves together, are going to do, those processes are going to continue for a long time to come and getting worse and worse and worse. Uh, we are so powerful and we are so clever that it is absolutely within man's power to devastate the fertility of the earth to such a degree that mass starvation will overcome us, homo sapiens, and with us a great deal of the animal life. And I suspect that the changes that are going to come to the uh, earth uh, will be of that kind rather than any other. The other thing that occurs to me to say is that if Darwin was right in the sense that he, in explaining evolution on which all serious zoologists are agreed, Darwin's mechanism of natural selection is the mainspring of evolution, then it has to be said that uh, natural selection has stopped largely in Homo sapiens. Because natural selection is only a polite way of saying natural rejection. You can't select without rejecting. And we do not reject our young even if they are uh, incapacitated in some way or less fit than others. But that is not actually an arg argument for eugenics. Uh, because the crucial factor that has made man into what we all are um, has been for the past 2,000 years, not physical evolution, but cultural evolution. My skeleton is indistinguishable in any important sense, morphologically, from the skeleton of a Stone Age man of 30,000 years ago. My skull capacity is not increased. My brain is not bigger. Uh, I'm, I'm slightly larger in terms of overall length, but that's because of nutrition rather than anything else. What makes me different from Stone Age man, me who has the capacity to look at uh, articles like this or television or to work computers or to read in a library, is not, any, is not anything physical up here. It is the cultural inheritance by which you and me and all of us are the inheritors of a thousand years of thought, of, of careful experiment, of, of, of uh, accumulated wisdom, which has been passed on not through my genes, not through DNA, but through libraries through uh, word of mouth, through memory, and now through computers. And it's cultural evolution which, is, which has enabled man to get into this situation where he is so clever as he is. What one hopes and prays is that he isn't just clever, but sooner or later, surely he might become wise. I really envy David Attenborough his knowledge of all of life and the success of his Life on Earth series. I'd like you to watch on your local PBS station. I think you'll enjoy it just as much as I did. I've spent 25 years looking at individual animals, looking at individual environments, and, and producing films and books about the details. And what I wanted to do after 25 years was to produce something which distilled the details and reduced it to the significant, reduced it to the important, so that you could actually get an overall view of what is, after all, the greatest story on Earth, four billion years story long of the development of life.